Voice of the Sea, learning from experts across the ocean. Welcome to Voice of the Sea. In this episode of Voice of the Sea, Kanisa visits the scientific research vessel Tara as it docks in Honolulu to change crew. We'll meet some crew members and learn about their amazing work. First, an introduction to the voyage so far. After its epic odyssey through the Arctic ice flow, the schooner Tara continues on its mission to serve the planet. A century after Cook, Darwin and Haeckel, a team of scientists take off on an expedition to explore life hidden under the surface of the oceans. An exceptional three-year journey across the world's seas to understand the impact of the oceans in the future of our planet. A strange and fascinating microscopic world lives under the ocean's skin, made up of millions of species, most of them unknown to man, but whose role is vital. The seawater's secret inhabitants are called plankton. This is an extremely complex world, very dynamic, that we are beginning to define. From seas to oceans, Tara will explore the submarine canopies in their millions of microscopic algae. This plant-like plankton, phytoplankton, produces half of the Earth's oxygen. Its role is key to the planet's climate. Exploration which will reveal an invisible animal world of infinite diversity, that of the zooplankton. I'm certain that 98% of these organisms are unheard of. Atlantic, Mediterranean, Indian Ocean, every time we probe the depths, precious samples of marine life will enrich our hold. What we are leaving to future generations are excellent quality samples. From Barcelona to Beirut, passing through Libya, and soon the shores of Africa, we will sound the oceans, we will probe their secrets. This journey to the heart of the oceans will plunge us into worlds teeming with life made up of algae, crustaceans, medusas, and into the even stranger world of bacteria and viruses. Who are these secret inhabitants? What are its powers? What can we learn about this marine world in link with the global warming of our planet? Teachings useful to mankind? These are the challenges of this historically unique expedition, the new Tara expedition, Tara Oceans. In this episode of Voice of the Sea, I went on board the Tara Expedition's boat in Honolulu Harbor to meet the crew. I talked to the captain, the first mate, the chief engineer, the scientist, and even the cook. We start with the deck engineer, Sarah Searson. I wanted to learn about her and what her job is really like. When we're at sea, there are no Saturdays and Sundays. We work when we work and every day is the same. We have to keep going, which is a bit of a pain and it's you know, work is work, work is a job, and you get stressed and overly focused and all these sorts of things. But the nice thing, the nice thing is that there are moments that are just brilliant. You know, you can be on deck drinking your coffee in the morning and the sun rises and it's a brilliant dawn or something like that. You know what I mean? It's, it's moments that make it. It's, a lot of people might think it's a big adventure and every day is wonderful. It's, the reality is it's quite mundane for most of the time, but there are moments that are just absolutely perfect. Uh, whales. We saw um, on this last leg. Oh, it's so cool. It's my birthday. <laughs> we're on station and we're working, and I'm thinking, what a way to spend the birthday. And all these, uh, I don't really know what they were, whether whether they were big dolphins or small whales, but they just uh, they just came by and floated past. It's like amazing. For my birthday. <laughs> <laughs> I really want to know about your piece of equipment here though. It's a, a CTD. That's right. Which is a conductivity, temperature and depth measuring device. That's right, you've been doing your homework. I've well been, done. I've been doing my homework and I also understand it's arranged in a, they call it a rosette. That's right, yep. And um, so as the engineer on the boat, Sarah, <laughs> what do you do? With, this, is, this is one of your ship's um, most important sampling pieces of equipment. That's right, it's a very basic piece of oceanographic equipment so on on any research vessel big or small pretty much you'll have something like this that's collecting 
the real basics, the real basic measurements that we need to make in oceanography to do any other kind of research to do with the water. You have to know like all the all the background stuff, you have to know what the temperature is in the cylinders. And right at the very beginning, that's pretty much all it was, was just those three measurements. But in fact, uh, we measure um, so many more things than that. I guess also the, the basic component is collecting water. That's one of the most basic things. So these grey bottles you can see here. Uh -huh. This is the rosette thing. Just It's a rosette because it's kind of circular. So when the CTD goes into the water, all of these bottles are open. Oh, I didn't realise. Yep, and you can see that they have a top and a bottom cap, obviously. Sure. Um, there's a computer control, and I'll tell you a little bit about that afterwards, but the computer controls when to close the bottles. So the CTD goes into the water. With our rosette, we often go down to 1,000 metres. That's a kilometre down. And then on the way up, uh, the computer is programmed to close each bottle at a different depth. So when the CCD comes back on board, we have, for example, water from 1,000 metres in this bottle, uh -huh. water from 800 metres, and so on. <laughs> so the, the computer control is very simple. Uh, it's done by pressure. So you program what depth to uh -huh. fire or trigger the bottles. And then there's just a really simple signal that gets sent to a little magnet here. <laughs> I can, um, what's the word, uh, trigger it manually like this. So the hook releases. And oh. Both caps close, so trapped inside the bottle is the water that we will you know, later analyse for different nutrients and stuff. So the important thing is to close the bottles on the way up, because if you were to have the bottles closed and then go down to depth, you know the whole thing with pressure and everything, sure. the, um, the urban legend is that if you have a bottle that's closed, going down to depth, it will explode or implode and it would uh, destroy the bottle and probably the bottles either side and any el electronics nearby. So it's quite important to gotcha. close them on the way up and on the way down. So we measure a lot of uh, standard nutrients that are in the water, things like silicates, um, or, uh, nutrients, HPLCs, all sorts of things. And the way they take the water out of the bottle is just there's a very simple little uh, uh, tap at the bottom here. So this is closed and then you just push it in and the water would come out. The CTD itself, the main brains of it is just just here. There's a, obviously a battery pack, power is an important issue. Um, you can see there's a lot of cables going to all the different sensors. Uh -huh. So I can, I can tell you this is the nitrate sensor over here. There's a camera system here. <laughs> you can't see on the camera, but uh, so there's a camera system, nitrate sensor. The sensors underneath here. Uh, this is a uh, temperature and conductivity. There's an oxygen sensor here. This is just a little pump. Uh, those, the two, the temperature and conductivity sensors are duplicated. Because it's such a basic measurement, it's always good to duplicate. So then we know if, if they suddenly start drifting apart or one of them is wrong, we know that there's a problem. If you only have one set of sensors, you, you can't always see if, it, if the data is reliable. So just like in a, a science uh, experiment in school, that's your replication factor? Yes, then. yeah, yeah. Um, this is a transmissometer. It measures uh, the transmission of light through the water. Uh, this is a, an extra battery pack. There are three instruments in, in the middle there that are measuring optical properties of water. So one of them is wow. a fluorometer. One of them measures CDOM, which is dissolved organic matter. And the other one is a backscatter meter. Uh, so you can see to the CTD has a lot of work to do to power all these things, to collect all the data, and it stores all the data. So for a CTD cast of 1,000 metres, it takes about one hour in the water to go down and come up. And then as soon as it's back on deck, you can see here all the cables. We connect up all the cables and then download the data. So these are two banks of LEDs. You can just see the, the lights are in there. Sure. So this space here, is a known, it's a calibrated area. Uh -huh. When something passes through here, it triggers the camera, it takes a picture. So the, you know, the, what is it? The, the, um, it's set up so that it's focused on this area. And then because it's calibrated, you get a, a picture of a plankton, uh, whatever it is. You know how big it is, but it's also tied in to all the other data that's being sure, collected. so you know where in the environment yep, is you living. Know, yeah, so you know what temperature it was, what depth it was, what the nitrate level was. Uh, just there's a, there's a lot of data that can be associated with this particular plankton. 
the software that is used then to analyze um, uh, this information can also do a lot of um, a lot of neat stuff sort of size distribution so you can get when you've got a lot of data about the size of things you can sort of see whether they're all hanging out you know pretty shallow or deep or where they are with all these all this kind of thing there's just so much data it's sometimes I think I have the easy part of the job because I just collect the data you know to process and make sense out of the data takes a lot of people a lot of time you know sure so after you guys are done with the three years on the Tara I imagine that the analysis will continue on for a good ways yes I I don't really have a good feel for it but I would I would guess it would take at least a year for you know for the preliminary analysis to be done for people to get together talk about what it all means and to start writing the papers I'm guessing a little bit but I would say it's a matter of you know a year or, or two years or something sometimes when I'm on the back deck uh, and I'm looking uh, at the CTD and the CTD comes on deck I, f I feel like I, uh, I am the first one to touch the data I'm just at the at the sharp end and I feel that if I look behind me there are hundreds of people involved in Tara hundreds of scientists you know hundreds of people that are looking after the logistics and getting me here and I touch it first <laughs> you know what I mean and I know that behind me there's hundreds of people and years before it's finished Do you know what I mean? it's kind of a neat feeling the curriculum research and development group in the College of Education at the University of Hawaii at Manoa CRDG has been providing quality educational programs and services for over 40 years, serving students, teachers, parents, educators, and experts around the world and here in Hawaii. The Curriculum Research and Development Group, Improving Schools, Improving Education, CRDG. Voice of the Sea, learning from experts across the ocean. You can see just behind you there we've got a plankton net and you know we collect plankton in it but we don't really ever find any fish because they're designed to, to escape things so then they can they can feel the pressure wave of the net before it arrives right. and then they scoot out of the way. You know when we're collecting the plankton and stuff it's really neat you can we bring up a net and then the end of the net uh, can I just show you maybe quickly yeah. this is one of the many nets we have you can we put this one down to 100 meters and then we just bring it up again. Um, you can see all, all the plankton comes in the net and gets collected in here. So when it comes back on deck, you take off the... And this, depending on where we are, it will be full of kind of concentrated plankton. When you look in it, it will just look like a bunch of, you know, goop. <laughs> pretty much you know you can't really see anything and so then you know I would hand that to our zooplankton specialist and they do some stuff and filter it and have a look at it and then later on they will look at some of the samples under a microscope and I can you'll see some of the pictures later some of the some of the things are just amazing They're, they look like aliens but when I when I look in here it's just kind of like oh it looks do you know what I mean you, you don't know what's in here there's, there's worlds in here do you know what I mean it's really cool Plankton comes from the Greek word planktos, which means wandering. Any living creature carried along by ocean currents is classified as plankton. It ranges in size from the tiniest virus to siphonophores, the longest animals in the world, and also includes microscopic algae, krill, or fish larvae. Some plankton, like these salps, drift all their lives. Others, like mollusks and fish, are only planktonic during their embryonic or larval state. When they reach adulthood, they settle or swim freely. Planktonic organisms play important roles in human life. Many microscopic species get their energy from photosynthesis. They absorb carbon dioxide and produce oxygen. Thus, they constantly renew the air we breathe. Plankton has also been a great provider of fossil energy. When it dies, it sinks to the seabed. This layer of sediment has fossilized for more than a billion years, producing our precious oil.
Finally, plankton nourishes us. It's the basis of the food chain in which the large eat the small. Without plankton, there would be no fish. Voice of the Sea, learning from experts across the ocean. Next, Kinesa heads to the microscope lab where Sarah shows off some of the Terra's recent planktonic discoveries. This actually is a crustacean. We thought we'd found an insect. I don't know. Oh my god. This just looks so much like a you know an alien straight out of the mothership. I think so too. The University of Hawaii Sea Grant College program focused on Hawaii's coasts and its communities through sustainable development, safe seafood supply, sustainable coastal tourism, hazard resilience, and healthy coastal ecosystems. Hawaii Sea Grant. That's uh, what we call that a wet lab because it uh, can be completely wet. Uh -huh. In fact, there is a lot of water. <laughs> uh, because uh, what we do is once we sample with the net or the pump or the CTD taking waters, uh -huh. we need to process, to pre process the sample. That means we can keep the water sample as they are, just putting some uh, conservative like formal, formaldehyde. Or we can, you know, in order to uh, take the animals, the organisms that are within the water, we can just filter them. So we filter them on this uh, bench and we use uh, very small filters. Uh, and then you pass through these filters, liters or hundreds of liters, depending on the quantity that are in the water. Uh -huh. So, and then we keep the filters. And the filters, they are kept in, uh, for most of them, in uh, liquid nitrogen. They need to be frozen instantaneously. So there is uh, some uh, big jars of liquid uh, nitrogen uh -huh. right there. And we just put the sample in it, or they are in small uh, cans, and then they are frozen. And then when, when it's uh, full, we just transport the the sample in the, in the freezer at minus uh, 80 de uh -huh. degrees. What's your guess? Is this a Chinese lantern, a Christmas decoration, or a flashing sign? None of those. This is pleurobrachia, which means arm at the side. A strange animal commonly called sea gooseberry or cat's eye. It's about the size of a marble. Pleurobrachia belongs to the ctenophore family from the Greek word ktenos, a comb. These iridescent combs are made up of thousands of little hairs, cilia, which they use for propulsion. Pleurobrachia are carnivorous. They capture their prey, zooplankton, using long tentacles armed with sticky cells, and then pull them towards their mouth. These animals are among the most ancient species known to have developed a neurosensorial system. By studying them, biologists hope to learn how the first neurons appeared. Information vital to an understanding of our own brain cells. So can you walk me through sort of physically what you would be doing in here and, and kind of show me? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, my part here, I'm not looking for organism, I'm just looking for uh, alkalinity, 
total inorganic carbon that's for CO2. Uh -huh. I'm looking for uh, pigments, cr uh, chlorophyll. I'm looking for nutrients, that's nitrate, uh, nitrate and phosphate and silicate. Uh -huh. Because that, together with the CTD parameters, that gives the uh, environmental conditions. So what I do here is just I'm filtering uh, water. I just feel that I have first to rinse them with the water from the, the Niskin bottles. Uh -huh. Then I fill them to just to here, that's two liters. So then I just imagine here that you put a, just a filter on it. The that's filters the one. are made out of glass fiber. Yeah. And um, how many okay, microns? Okay, it's on maps and 0.7 microns. Can the you tell me in um, sort of a comparison, what does 0.7 microns mean? Uh, micron. <laughs> A micrometer is a thousandth of a millimeter. Uh -huh. So it's a little bit less than a thousandth of a millimeter. That's the average uh, uh, mesh of this uh, diameter of the, the holes within that uh, uh, filter. So imagine the ship is moving. <laughs> <laughs> and that you have another people behind you. So you have let just little of space. You have to put that here, in that case. So it goes down. It fills up automatically down to here, and then you just open that. There is a small vacuum there. there are I pump, see. Uh -huh. but with the vacuum, just uh, the ga the water goes through the filter, and it takes about five minutes to uh, to filter the two liters. And the product that you keep from that again is the filter itself. Yes. Now, after two liters, you could see that there is something on it, something greenish, yellowish, but that's it. But sometimes when you are in a very, uh, very rich region of the ocean, then it can be really green. So if you want to see a lot of smoke with liquid nitrogen, I put this. This is room temperature. Oh. So it's minus 70 uh, degrees. So it's rather cold. But it's, uh, it cools and it's fresh. How do you call that? Fresh freezing. <laughs> <laughs> and it is important to keep the the quality of the sample. Otherwise, it can degrade mm -hmm. rapidly with time. So I like to participate and to um, to help for this project. I mean, I'm very interested. By I'm working in the Mediterranean Sea mostly on the, the coastal mm -hmm. oceanography and sediment transport. So it's a completely different. Uh, uh, project for me, uh -huh. and that's the second time I'm here. And I did the two equatorial legs, one in the Indian Ocean, one in the Pacific. So that's just fantastic for me. Exploring Our Fluid Earth is a dynamic curriculum developed by the University of Hawaii's Curriculum Research and Development Group. Teaching ocean science concepts through the disciplines of physics, chemistry, biology, and ecology. Exploring Our Fluid Earth is now available freely online. Find out more at exploringourfluidearth.org. Turn your love of the ocean into a lifelong career. Join NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, as we unlock the secrets in the deep oceans, track rapidly moving storms, model climate trends, protect and preserve our marine resources, and so much more. It's all in a day's work at NOAA. Find a career that makes a world of difference, enriching life through science, service, and stewardship. NOAA.